I am honored and delighted to introduce Dr. Herb Chen, our president. As you can see, he looks tremendously distinguished here. <laughs> and he is the current chair of surgery and surgeon in chief at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. When I first met Herb around 20 years ago at this very meeting, he had no gray hair. I remember thinking to myself, who is this friendly, enthusiastic fellow endocrine surgeon? Well, let me tell you a little bit about him with some help from his friends and family. There is no other way to describe Herb's academic accomplishments except to call him a superstar. Here he is with his department at UAB. Herb has been incredibly productive, as you can see in this brief summary. He is an accomplished surgeon scientist with millions of dollars of grant funding, a prolific writer and editor, a highly sought after speaker, and a transformative leader in multiple surgical organizations. Here you see Herb with his UAB graduating chiefs this past June. As an educator and mentor, Herb Chen has made an impact on countless medical students, residents, fellows, and faculty. He even tried his best to mentor me as a peer, getting me involved in the AAS, encouraging my research efforts, and inviting me to the University of Wisconsin. And I have seen him do this for countless others over the years. So let's go back in time. Herb was born in the year of the horse in Staten Island, New York, the eldest son of Dr. Homo and Mrs. Shimei Chen. Herb's dad was an orthopedic surgeon, now retired, and his mom was first a nurse, then mother and center of the family. Here is Herb with his brother Fred in New Jersey, where he spent his early childhood. As I mentioned, Herb was born in the year of the horse. And my internet research reveals that this could account for some of these characteristics of Herb Chen. He is friendly and generous, enthusiastic and positive, talented in leadership, insightful, and it is said, male horses are particularly romantic. <laughs> Herb looks a little uncertain about his outfit in this picture. <laughs> and when we visited Hong Kong, he was also a bit skeptical about being dragged to get measured for a suit. But he was ultimately quite pleased with the result. So Herb moved to Marshfield, Wisconsin at age five, where his father practiced orthopedic surgery at the Marshfield Clinic. Here he is playing mahjong with his dad, brother Fred, and sister Jenny. And it is in Wisconsin that Herb became an avid Packer and Badger fan. So while Herb was growing up in Marshfield, the fifth president of the AAES, Dr. C.A. Wang, was making his seminal contributions to endocrine surgery in Boston. So since we are honoring the past, I'd like to briefly weave in some AAES history. Dr. Wang was our fifth president and the first Asian president of AAES, with her being our fourth after Drs. Kwan Du and Ashok Shaha. Dr. Wang completed Harvard Medical School and general surgery residency at MGH in the 1940s. He practiced surgery in China and in Hong Kong, but re returned back to the MGH in the 1960s. He worked closely with Dr. Oliver Cope. He was an authority on the anatomy of the parathyroid glands and an early pioneer of focused parathyroidectomy using ultrasound, intraoperative PTH monitoring, and thyroid needle biopsy. And now, back to Dr. Chen. So Herb's favorite sport was tennis growing up. He was the city champion for his age for many years. 
and he was captain of the Marshfield Tiger tennis team. He sang in the Madrigal Choir. He was also president of his high school class. And you will note that being a leader, the interest in singing, and dressing up in interesting costumes will be recurring themes. <laughs> so Herb graduated from Stanford with honors and distinction and also found time to be an untouchable. He then moved to North Carolina to attend medical school at Duke. This is also where he met Harriet, and more on that later. He sang in the barbershop quartet, and he was president of his medical school class. He dressed up as a pirate, and he graduated AOA. He then spent eight years at Johns Hopkins, including years in the lab, and served as one of Dr. Cameron's chief residents. He completed a fellowship in surgical oncology and endocrinology with his mentors, Dr. Udelsman and Zeiger, both former presidents of this organization. So Herb met Harriet at Duke, first at the medical school formal, which of course Herb organized and founded. He then won her over on the sit-up mat at the gym. Harriet was at the time a neonatal ICU nurse who grew up in North Carolina. They married one week after medical school graduation and four years later were the proud parents of Alex and Liz. Here is Herb enjoying family time with Alex and Harriet. I believe this was during his lab years, which was productive in both research and children. <laughs> After finishing at Hopkins, Herb was recruited back to the University of Wisconsin and he built his clinical practice and research career. He recruited additional partners in endocrine surgery and established an endocrine surgery fellowship. He took on increasingly important administrative roles and was recruited in 2015 to become chair at UAB. So one of the great things about Herb is his ability to combine work with friendship and play. Here is the Chen Lab annual canoe trip, which has been going on for 13 years. And here is Herb demonstrating his skiing and wakeboarding skills. And here is Herb with his many friends and colleagues, um, many of whom are here today. And here is Herb with Harriet, who is an amazing wife and mother, wakeboarder, snowboarder, and now professional photographer. They are clearly an adventurous, and if I may say so, romantic team. Harriet, thank you for providing me with these quotes. <laughs> um, this is uh, Herb and his extended family. Alex is a first year medical student at Yale and hopefully future surgeon. Liz is a senior at UNC Chapel Hill, majoring in journalism with a minor in English. She is, according to Herb, an awesome writer, blogger, copy editor, and here she is visiting Sydney with Herb. So I had a lot of fun putting this introduction together. And I hope that you know a little bit more about Herb after this. Finally, I'd like to say thank you to Herb for being our inspiring leader this year and choosing to emphasize diversity and inclusion in our organization. Dr. Herb Chen. Thank you, Sona, for, for a wonderful introduction. 
As many past AE, AES presidents have said, one of the most daunting tasks is to figure out actually what to say in front of all these people during your presidential address. And I know some of you were hoping to hear me speak about not signing in neuroendocrine tumors um, <laughs> or radioguided parathyroidectomy. Um, I hope you will allow me to talk about something that, uh, more personal and I want to share uh, some personal and sometimes some painful experiences I have had and hopefully to enlighten you a little bit about who am I or uh, to focus on the topic of who are you. So as a young boy growing up in rural Wisconsin, I spent a lot of time listening to The Who. Could you click on the video for me? So their iconic song, Who Are You, asks a question about one's identity and purpose. And in reflecting upon my life and career to date, we spend the majority of our lives discovering who we are, who we want to be. So the question is, who am I? As Sonia sort of uh, described a little bit in her talk, I'm a husband. And the most important person in my, life, in my life is my wife, Harriet. We are celebrating our 27th anniversary next month, and she has supported me during this entire time and really sacrificed her career for mine. I love you dearly. I had the joy of being a father uh, to two children, my daughter Liz, who's about to graduate from UNC uh, in journalism with a minor in English, and she is looking for a job, so anyone uh, that has an open job, <laughs> For a writer and a great copy editor and a webmaster, please, uh, um, she's available and up here in the front. <laughs> and uh, my son Alex is a first year med student at Yale and I'm hoping a future surgeon. I am the son of a retired orthopedic surgeon, Hong Mo Chen, who showed me that you can love your career as a surgeon and also love life. He came to the United States after doing a complete orthopedic residency in Taiwan only have to repeat the same residency again in the United States. I'm told he's the first Taiwanese surgeon to train in the United States. Now the mother is often the center and the ground of the family, and my mom, Shimei Chen, is definitely that. I think this picture of our extended family with my sister Jenny and her family, my brother Fred and his family shows that well. My brother Fred, sister-in-law Holly, uh, uh, sister Holly, and my niece Abby are right here in the front row, and I'm uh, grateful that they made the trip. So as Aristotle said, knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom. I want to spend the next 30 minutes with you sharing my experiences as I ponder the question, who am I? So in reflecting on this question, I would currently describe myself in these three words. Asian, a leader, and an endocrine surgeon. My talk will focus on these three themes and definitely my, uh, at times, struggle to assume these identities. So there was a period in my life when I did not want to be Asian because I did not want to be different. And in fact, I don't think I'm the only one in this room who has had these feelings because being a minority in the United States at times can have its challenges. So there have been many instances where foreigners or minorities have been attacked and unfortunately killed in the United States due to their race and being different. So I wanna shed light on the largest mass lynching in American history. As our new home is in Birmingham, Alabama, maybe you are expecting that I'm going to talk about an incident in the Deep South. However, this event occurred here in Los Angeles, California on October 24th, 1871. 500 people entered Chinatown and attacked, robbed, and murdered Chinese residents. An estimated 17 to 20 Chinese immigrants were hanged by the mob in the course of the riot. And due to the fear of too many Asians entering the United States, Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. On American Experience, 
The Chinese exclusion law is the first time that a group is singled out by name as being undesirable. There was horrific violence against the Chinese. People would fan out and attack any poor soul that happened to be on the street. How could this country do what it did against a whole class of people? The Chinese Exclusion Act on American Experience. So Asian immigration to the U.S. was restricted in the 1960s. And in 1964, my parents came to the United States. I grew up in Marshfield, Wisconsin, as the only Asian student in my class. Although I had a wonderful childhood with fantastic education and sports opportunities, there were many challenges. And there was one challenge that I've never really talked much about. And while I had many friends that accepted me, there were many people who did not. So I know this is a very painful word cloud, but I was called every single name in this figure. And in fact, in grade school, my best friend would announce every December 7th as Kill Your Herbie Chen Day to recognize the day that the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor and how he thought Americans should react to this. And ironically, I'm not Japanese, but clearly some people group all Asians together. <laughs> so what were the consequences of these words? So as a child, I did not want to be different. I did not want to be Asian. I tried to reject everything associated with being Asian. I did not want to use chopsticks. I did not want to eat rice or sushi. I did not want to speak Chinese, only wanted to speak English. And in fact, people thought of me, as many still do today, as a banana. Yellow on the outside, but white on the inside. However, all this teasing and taunting also made me tougher. And these painful words and experiences instilled in me resilience. So earlier today, you heard my boss and fellow Halstead resident and friend Selwyn Vickers speak about resilience. And in that address, he defined resilience in the physical definition. Resilience is the amount of force that can be sustained by an object without causing a permanent deformity as shown in this equation. Resilience is an inability's ability to properly adapt to stress or adversity. So as I reflect on these past hard times, I now realize that these experiences gave me resilience. And resilience allows me to adapt to the many stressful situations I now face as a surgeon and as an administrator. And instead of getting frustrated and angry, I have learned to channel that negative energy into a positive force to improve outcomes. And people often comment that they have never seen me angry or frustrated. And that's in, uh, the emoji my daughter made for me. <laughs> So in heading to Stanford for college, I was then surrounded by many people who looked like me, and I further learned to embrace uniqueness and diversity. Now, I also realized that my experiences as an Asian American were not unique. My friend Jennifer Sang, who was a fellow Stanford alum, president of the Society of Asian Academic Surgeons and current chair of surgery at Boston University, shared this post on Facebook. I love America. I am American. I don't have anywhere to go back to, which I was told, which my parents were told in front of me as a 10-year-old while trying to buy their dream car, a Buick Skylark. At almost 50, I still occasionally have nightmares of kids pulling up the corners of their eyes and chanting Chinese, Japanese, dirty knees. Now, do racial slurs still occur today? A recent study from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation unfortunately shows that 35% of Asian Americans today experience offensive comments, 32% experience slurs because of their race. <coughs> so as an adult now, I have made the commitment to advocate for Asians and other underrepresented groups. The Society of Asian Academic Surgeons, uh, or SAS, was founded to, uh, on the personal and professional development of Asian academic surgeons. Please note that membership to SAS is open to any individual with an interest in academic surgery and not limited to those of Asian's descent. So this slide shows that SAS founders and leadership at the top, including the SAS president-elect, our, our uh, own member, Tracy Wang. Congratulations, Tracy, on your election. 
The members of the AAE leadership who are also members of SAS are shown at the bottom of the slide. And I want to thank you for, for thank them for joining the organization. You can see that many AAES members participate in the annual SAS meeting, which is focused on leadership development and advocacy. Now, career success is often dependent upon senior leaders who set the example, advocating and fighting for young surgeons. And there's probably no one better who exemplifies this than Kwan Du. Earlier today, the AES honored Kwan for his contributions to endocrine surgery with the Oliver Cope Award. But importantly, a few months ago, SAS recognized Kwan with the first ever Trailblazer Award in recognition to, for contributions to surgical science and for paving the way for the next generation of surgeons. Thank you, Kwan, for everything you have done for me and for the many people in this room. You are truly a trailblazer. So the third consequence of my childhood experiences have led me to advocate for other underrepresented groups. Now the AAES has set an example for academic surgery in many arenas. In one study by one of our UAB medical students, Leah Scholl, which will be an oral presentation actually at the IAES, there are more women in endocrine surgery compared to other surgical subspecialties. Our AES treasurer, Saray Parangi, is the president of the Association of Women Surgeons. Many institutions, including UAB, have women in surgery events, and I think the AES must work with the AWS to totally support their initiatives. So in a study by Lindsay Kuo, Saray Parangi, and Nancy Cho, you can see that the number of female members in the AES has steadily grown. The number of Asian members of AES has dramatically increased. However, we still have low numbers of Hispanics, Latinos, and African American members, and the, no and the low numbers of women and minorities in leadership positions are also shown. And I'm hoping that we together can change this. Please join us at the diversity panel tomorrow as we discuss some of these issues and work to find solutions. I've invited leaders from SAS, the AWS, the Latino Surgical Society, and SBAS to participate. So getting back to my initial question of who are you, I am now very proud to say that I'm Asian. Now the second part of my address will focus on becoming a leader. Now when I finished my training, my first boss was Bing Rickers, who was a fantastic mentor. He recruited me to the University of Wisconsin, and while I knew this was a wonderful place to build a research program, you know, I wasn't quite sure about the endocrine surgery part. So in the decade before I came to Wisconsin, they were only doing about 20 to 30 parathyroid operations a year at the entire institution. When I interviewed there, they told me that I could never build an endocrine practice there. And so I wondered, should I really take the risk and go to Wisconsin? Or should I go to a place which already had an established endocrine surgery program? So building an endocrine practice takes time. In a recent study by Jen Kuo in the Annals of Surgery, in the first four years of practice, endocrine surgeons, that's AAES members, average only 58 endocrine operations annually. And after 15 years, the average AAES member is performing 121 endocrine operations annually. Now, I was very fortunate at Wisconsin to have fantastic partners in Becky Sippel, Dave Snyder, and Sarah Schaefer. And so remember, I had taken a risk to go to Wisconsin, essentially where there was no endocrine practice, but together our team, we were able to build a high volume endocrine program, and we were able to increase the practice by 15 fold. And the risk of coming to the University of Wisconsin had paid off in so many ways. In my lab, I was able to work with outstanding general surgery residents, endocrinology fellows, overseas fellows, and medical students who would eventually become endocrine surgeons or endocrinologists. 
I got to participate in the training of outstanding Wisconsin endocrine surgery fellows as shown in this photo here. In fact, I became very comfortable at Wisconsin, like Carmen Sorlazano cruising on a wakeboard as shown here. <laughs> um, so taking a risk and going to Wisconsin had definitely paid off in many ways. In fact, I became very, very comfortable at Wisconsin. Uh, so everything was stable and calm. But then I got a phone call from my friend Selwyn Vickers to come look at a job in Alabama. Now, many of you may think of Alabama in this way. Forrest Gump and the Sea of Cotton Fields. And I have to admit, that's actually what I thought initially, too. <laughs> so I told Selwyn I was not interested. And then Harriet said, as Selwyn uh, said earlier today, that she, would, she was never going to move to Alabama. And then I thought, you know, why would I ever want to take a risk and lose everything that I had at Wisconsin, leave great partners, leave great fellows to do something like this? And then Selwyn Vickers, in his very wise words, said to me, you will not continue to grow as an individual or as a leader if you do not take some risk. So I truly believe this statement. Life begins at the end of your comfort zone. That is, for individuals to grow, we must put ourselves in uncomfortable situations. Therefore, we decided to take some risk again and move to Alabama. Now, by taking another risk, I have believed that I have grown as a person and as a leader. I have had the great opportunity to work with outstanding division directors and vice chairs at UAB. And I want to thank Greg Kennedy, Marty Heslin, George Yang, and my predecessor, Kirby Bland, for being here today in celebration. We have really built a fantastic Department of Surgery. We have a very engaged team of faculty who are aligned and unified. We have created a new endocrine surgery service at UAB, and my new partners, Bernessa Lindemann, Kelly Lovell, Tom Wang, and John Porterfield have been fantastic. We started a new endocrine surgery fellowship and have matched our first two fellows, Sophie and Jess. And with the collaboration of Renata Stuhl, my long-term research partner, we have a great endocrine research team who will actually present two oral abstracts at the meeting on Tuesday morning, so I hope everyone stays for that. And our nationally ranked team at UAB wears scrubs. So we really discovered what Alabama really looks like in these pictures. So as you know that we are hosting the annual meeting next year in Birmingham, and Harriet and I would invite all of you to come and wake surf with us at our lake in Alabama. Now, for a society such as the AES to grow, we must take some risk. In order for endocrine surgeons and the AES to have more influence, our members must take risk and build more endocrine surgery programs. Now, we are very friendly, and endocrine surgeons tend to stick together. So if you look at this distribution of AES members put together by Vikram, we feel much more comfortable to be part of a large group. But we must, as a society, try to grow the number of endocrine surgery programs nationally. We must have our members step up and establish to lead new programs in these white and yellow areas, as shown on this map. Now, as a group, endocrine surgeons have been successful in leadership roles such as chairs of surgery. Here are a few of our members who have taken this role. However, we need many more AAES members to seek these and other leadership roles in the field of surgery. Now, in order to prepare our membership to take these leadership roles, we have established a career development task force led by Tracy Wang, John Liu, and Fiemu Moriaku. This group will identify opportunities to promote endocrine surgeons as leaders in American surgery. Part of their mission will be to develop strategies to increase the number of endocrine surgery programs nationally. Now, to move this forward, we have formed a collaboration with the Society of University Surgeons, led by President Greg Kennedy, sitting here in the front row, 
to provide leadership training opportunities and scholarship for AES members to attend the mid-career course, as well as the Leadership Agility Program. I am hoping that many of our young endocrine surgeons in the audience will take advantage of this opportunity. So getting back to my initial question of who are you, I am proud to say, like many AES members in the audience, a leader. And now the third and final part of my address will focus on becoming an endocrine surgeon. So I came to Johns Hopkins as a young surgical resident actually wanting to be a surgical oncologist. And there I met Rob Udelsman and Martha Zeiger, who basically showed me the light and led me on the path to endocrine surgery. And I can never thank either of them enough for all they did uh, for me and everything to do with my clinical abilities and my research abilities. And I certainly have valued their mentorship and guidance both then and certainly now. And obviously, Rob and Martha introduced me to the AAES as a junior resident. And since then, the AAES has been a huge part of my professional and personal life. I've had the great honor to serve our society under the AAES president shown here. And I want to thank them for the many opportunities they provided for me to learn and grow as an individual and as an, as an endocrine surgeon. And through the AES, I have met endocrine surgeon friends from around the world, many of them in the audience today. And they're shown in these pictures that I had the chance to spend time with them at their institution. And the AES has also enriched my golf game <laughs> through the mentoring of my AES foursomes. And so I really think each of us finds value in the AES and is committed to our organization and the mission. You know, but the question is, does anyone else know about the AES or know what endocrine surgeons do? So Bernessa Lindemann uh, led a study to really ask this question, what do people think of endocrine surgeons? And unfortunately, only 21% of healthcare providers or others recognized endocrine surgery as a subspecialty only 14% could correctly identify what is an endocrine surgeon. So really, who is gonna change that? Well, obviously, I think we can. I have had the great honor of working with the most talented AES offers in council. And through their leadership, and with our community uh, committee and task force chairs, and with our institutional liaisons, we have made this a top priority over this last year. We created the Endocrine Surgery Identity Task Force, led by Jen Quo and President-elect Alan Sipperstein. Their mission is to define the value of endocrine surgeons to patients, healthcare professionals, organizations, and systems. And they have these three objectives listed here. They have made so much progress, and I really want to credit Alan for coming up with this idea for the Endocrine Surgery Task Force, and I definitely know, Alan, you will drive this to completion during your presidency. And here's an example of one endocrine of our surgeons projects. surgeons look at the patient as a whole, from all the different type of endocrine disorders that the patient may have, doing research to try to help advance the field. They're solely dedicated to patients who have endocrine disease. Endocrine surgeons offer the kind of care that patients with diseases of the thyroid, parathyroid, adrenals, and even pancreas may need. We have extra training in these diseases and the disorders themselves, not just in the surgical removal of an organ. I think patients really benefit from seeing endocrine surgeons because uh, they know they are seeing someone uh, who has specialized their practice uh, in uh, endocrine disease and has a high volume to make sure that that patient has the best possible outcome. Endocrine surgeons are always willing to take your calls. They're always willing to hear, um, hear what um, questions you have and also to help figure out the diagnosis and the possible treatment and options, whether they're surgical or not, um, with any of the mid-level providers, primary care physicians, and patients alike. Endocrine surgeons are extremely passionate about, about what they do. 
uh, primarily because we really want the best outcomes for our patients. We're able to provide them the best comprehensive approach, and sometimes it's not surgery. And understanding that and um, being their biggest patient advocate through the whole process um, is the biggest advantage to patients. The field is constantly changing, and if, um, if you're not on top of those changes and, and are a quickly, rapidly evolving understanding of these disease processes, you're not going to be able to offer the best treatment for patients. Endocrine surgeons are at the forefront. We are advancing the science and practice of endocrine surgery. Not just surgery, it's taking care of the whole patient. We are hundreds of surgeons performing thousands of operations to ensure the best care for our patients. I am an endocrine surgeon. 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 So that video has over 4,000 views and we're hoping to increase that. So I'm gonna ask for your help in a, at the end of my talk to do that. So we also created the Patient Advocacy Task Force led by Sally Cardi and Keppel Patel. Their mission is to partner with patient support groups to identify the educational needs of patients and work to identify programs that the AES can develop to help improve the education of patients. Now through social media and under the leadership of IT Committee Chair Barb Miller, we have partnered with patients to educate the public about endocrine surgery using Twitter chats, Facebook sessions, and more. So getting back to my initial question of who are you, I am an endocrine surgeon. So in closing, in sharing my journey to discover who I am as described by these three words, I hope that you will take away these three messages. One, embrace diversity. Let's continue to make the AES in the field of surgery the most deserve, uh, diverse and inclusive place. Number two, take risk. Leave a comfortable situation to boldly go where no one has gone before. Let's grow the influence of endocrine surgery and increase our roles as leaders. And three, promote the AAES as a leading organization in the field. So how can you do that? So as I complete my term as president, I want to thank Alan, Sonia, James, Surrey, and Paul and the council for their devotion to the AES. I have truly loved working with you. And as one of my last tasks as presidents, I want to ask two small favors from everybody in the audience. Now, when I was giving a talk uh, to a group of primary care uh, physicians, trying to explain to them what an endocrine surgeon is and what an endocrine surgeon does, they said to me, why don't you put endocrine surgeon on your slides? And I said, wow, okay, you're right. So I hope that all of you <laughs> now will join me in putting proudly endocrine surgeons on all of your title slides when you speak to let everyone know who you are. And two, get out your phones. I want you to please tweet, Facebook, Instagram, our new AES video. So we learned the first video I showed you is a little long. It cannot be put on Instagram. So we made an MTV version that's totally to a song without speaking. And right now I'm gonna ask Barb Miller to release this on the AES Twitter site. And I hope each of you will get on there and retweet that so we show everyone in the world what an endocrine surgeon is. And I'm gonna have you roll the video right now so you can see it as we tweet it out. I feel like for the first time in Like when I close my eyes
Thank you for the privilege of serving as your president this year. It's been my highest honor. Thank you. So Herb, on behalf of uh, the entire um, officer corps, the council, I think the membership as well, um, it's very clear that in typical Chen fashion, you have transformed this organization this year, and um, you know we look forward to telling everyone about all of the great initiatives that um, uh, that you've really spearheaded this year. Um, and just on a personal note, it's been uh, a great honor uh, working with you and learning from you this year, uh, so thank you. Um, as Herb mentioned, and many of you know, uh, Herb is a golf fanatic, and so um, as the AAS gift this year, we had commissioned uh, these golf head covers um, in fine Corinthian leather, oh one gosh. for your head cover, and then this is for the office as well, uh, saying Herb Chen President 2018 to 19. <laughs>